everyone, and welcome to today's program. My guest this evening is no stranger to this program and to the Armenian community, and I'm very happy to welcome State Senator Anthony Portentino back. It's great to be back. Welcome Thank back, you. Senator, Thank and you. welcome back because you just went to Armenia, uh, and uh, we're really excited to hear what uh, what you did there it's you have consistently gone to armenia since you've been in office I how have. many times has it been this was my fifth trip okay and it was my longest trip i was there All for right. 20 days and uh, what was the uh, purpose of the visit well the biggest purpose is i wanted to go <laughs> um so that was the you know i do try to go every year uh, as i can um and uh, wanted to make sure I went at least one more time as the current mm -hmm. state senator. And I had the opportunity to guest lecture at AUA, American University of Armenia, which I had visited in, on almost every trip. I'd spent time there, but I'd never taught there. And so they were excited to give me the opportunity to talk to their political science uh, classes. They had some open conversations where they invited the community and alums mm -hmm. and, and faculty. And so I think I did nine different lectures over two weeks at mm -hmm. AUA. So that was sort of the one of the official reasons. And then there were two conferences uh, that, I, that were happening while I was there, and mm -hmm. I got to speak. There was a human rights conference that I got to speak at, and then there was the Diasporan Global Armenian Summit that I got to speak at. And then, you know, having a couple weekends in between all the official activities, I got to go to the country, which wow. I never had sort of just un unwound in the beautiful country. Yeah. And, uh, so it was a great trip. Yeah, it's always important to kind of leave Yerevan and mm -hmm. see the rest of uh, uh, the country. You get to meet with the locals. and uh, th th Tell me about the students at AUA. Oh. What, what, did, what, were your, what was your impression? The students were amazing. Uh, they were engaged. They were smart. They were caring. Um, they were challenging. They, they were not shy with their opinions. Um, their perspectives and oftentimes they didn't agree with each other but what was really exciting for me is when we had discussions and there was disagreement it was always a civil conversation mm -hmm. it was always based on the policy it wasn't personality driven people were sitting next to each other who were friends who had disagreements uh, uh, in particular Ukraine uh, the Ukrainian situation brought out a lot of different perspectives from from the students and so uh, you know, the dad in me loved just listening to the, these smart uh, students uh, converse with one another. And I think that was a little bit of a different perspective for them. I think uh, many of their, the lectures that they're used to being in are more traditional lectures, where I was sort of drawing them into a conversation, which is more my style. And so I think they, you know, several kids came back to multiple classes because they enjoyed the conversation. That made me feel good that the, yeah. you know, they, were, they, wanted, they wanted more of, of that conversation. And so the students were really, really talented and smart and uh, loved my two weeks there. Mm -hmm. And the human rights conference you spoke at, was, was that with Ocampo? Uh, well, uh, uh, Erica Kopian yeah. was, the, was the moderator and um, there were several, several uh, academic human rights experts and they asked me to talk. Uh, obviously, I, I'm the only U.S. politician in the country who's actually went to Artsakh post 44 day mm -hmm. war. And we know with COP29 coming up in Azerbaijan sort of using it to whitewash its, its despicable behaviors and try to curry favor, there was a big emphasis to, to condemn that and to talk about strategies uh, of that and obviously uh, the most important strategy is don't support it, don't go, you know, expose it for what it is. So for me, it was an honor just to be included mm -hmm. in, in that conversation. And I will, uh, at the, the Global Armenian Summit, one of the questions was, what advice do you have for those of us who are planning the future of Armenia? And I couldn't resist saying, ask the students. <laughs> you know, you're, you're planning their future. Make sure young people have a seat at the table as you're planning their future, yeah. you know, because they deeply care about their country. Uh, they deeply care about the future um, and they have a lot to say and they're smart and they should be able to have input into into these global discussions about the future of, of Hayastan. Yeah, um, I want to come back to the COP29 and um, <laughs> Every, everyone's talking about how uh, it's the second year that the United Nations Climate Summit is being held in a country that 
does not have very good environmental, uh, record. environmental right. record and human rights record. Uh, what can California do as one of the leading environmental <laughs> states uh, in the country? Well, first and foremost, I've encouraged all my colleagues not to go because typically we'll send a legislative delegation. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be a half a dozen assembly members and you know half a dozen senators that go, and I've counseled them all not to not to show, you know, not to give it the standing that they want it to have. And I think that's something we should do. And I, I think we should use that boycott. We should make a statement with it. We should not, you know, we as collectively, the assembly, the Senate, the governor's office, everybody should make a united statement from California on our position of why we're not going. And then also, um, you know, you have a situation where you have, you know, many, many uh, uh, Artsakh leaders being held illegally uh, as prisoners, as as hostages, and uh, I know there's this notion that somehow they're going to use COP to leverage to get them out, and obviously I want every effort known to man to try to get uh, these hostages released, many of whom, as you know, have been visited us. Yes. You've had them on your show, and yes. I've had them in my office <laughs> in Glendale, and I've had dinner with them in in uh, Stepanakirk. Mm. I mean, they're, they're our friends. Um, and they should not be being held as hostages. So I think um, California should wade in on, you know, that should be one of the reasons why we don't go. It shouldn't just be, you know, because of their horrendous human rights record and their horrendous environmental record. We should put on record and you're holding, you know, government officials illegally hostage uh, from Artsakh. And I think that would be a good thing for California to do. How did your appeals on the hostages resonate in different circles in Armenia when you were there? Well, I specifically requested a meeting with the U.S. ambassador, uh, Ambassador Kavin, who is from California, actually went to Occidental College and is very familiar uh, with the Armenian mm -hmm. community. Um, and I was quite impressed with her. Um, but the reason why I asked for a meeting was to you know, press her to do everything in her power to uh, try to get the hostages home. I'm not allowed to say how yeah, she course. responded to my, uh, my pressure, but I, I can say that I found her earnest. I found her to be truthful and caring about the situation and knowledgeable. And so I do believe the U.S. is doing what it can do. Again, you can always do more. You know, we can always make it front and center. Um, and obviously one of the issues that you know Artsakh has struggled with is there's so many other things going on in the world and you know it's our effort our goal to make sure that we we elevate the Artsakh situation uh, on par with the other mm -hmm. international crises and again that's one of the reasons why I was yeah. there and one of the reasons why I'm here um, and what I do you know try to do every day is mm -hmm. to highlight uh, what goes on in that and I think world. one of the reasons that there is such a pointed uh, kind of posturing about the Ukraine issue in Armenia uh, is because of the way that the United States has embraced that whole issue since 2014, even right. before the invasion, but right. since 2014. And many Armenians uh, believe that everything that happened in Artsakh and is happening right now, you know, uh, the U.S. is picking and choosing which uh, way to put its efforts. Uh, yeah, and uh, and it's clear. It's certainly easy to see why uh, many folks in in Armenia believe that they're not getting the attention that they're that they should be getting. Uh, you know, when you displace 120,000 people from their homeland, you know, under any circumstance, that should get tremendous international outrage mm -hmm. and condemnation. The whole blockade of the Lashin Corridor should have gotten much more international attention uh, than it did. Um, and, you know, the cynic could say it's because of the oil interests and other things. Um, it's because of the other, you know, pressure from the other side. Um, uh, you could also say that, you know, we all need to do a better job of just highlighting the human rights abuses and, and, and the terror. Um, as you know, I did a hearing uh, a few years ago in Sacramento on the Sumgait pogroms. Mm -hmm. um, again, we had a survivor of the pogroms, and one of the reasons why I had her there was to let people know this really did happen. And of course, there were Azerbaijani protesters at my hearing. Who, you know, you always have to have a public comment period. You can't just not yeah. give everybody an opportunity. You know, under the law, we have to provide an opportunity for everybody to speak. And 
sure enough, they came to the microphone and said, this didn't happen, and that what she said isn't true. You know, it was revisionist history. Um, but we have to continue to tell the truth. We have to articulate the, not just the atrocities, but how, how the international community deals with them relative to how they're dealing with other countries. Mm -hmm. And some of the efforts that um, you've spearheaded in the state legislature, um, let's go through some of the uh, important ones, especially the uh, Commission on Artsakh and Armenia. So we as legislators, we get to form our own committees on an issue that we care about. Um, and most uh, legislators will pick something germane to their district. And obviously, for me, having been to Artsakh, pre-44 day war and then post-44 day war um, and spending significant time there and, and learning and feeling the love of the people for this wonderful part of the world, uh, it was important that when I chose to do a, create my own select committee, uh, not only did I put Armenia in the title, but I put Artsakh in the title. So I created California's uh, State Senate Select Committee on California, Armenia, and Artsakh Mutual Aid trade and cultural exchange and so which is why I ho hosted that hearing uh, we had a subsequent hearing uh, with business leaders you know promoting the idea of having a, uh, a non-stop flight from LA to Yerevan that's a very very mm -hmm. important uh, effort it's another thing that I talked to the ambassador about I said if there's one economic thing that we can achieve uh, having a direct flight from LA to Yerevan would be off the charts well received by the Armenian community. So I pressed her on that and so we had a hearing and we've met with a number of the major airlines. So I've been trying to use that committee to not just help uh, any one particular issue but sort of the big picture issues. Uh, and as you know we also signed an agreement between uh, California and Armenia to set up a trade desk mm -hmm. at, at Impact Hub in uh, Yerevan and I was happy to fly to New York when the governor signed mm -hmm. the agreement with the Armenian officials that were at the UN that time. And so uh, that was the first formal trade uh, agreement that uh, California negotiated. Was the first one was with, with Armenia. And so that's something that I you know, helped negotiate and feel very, very positive about the, the legacy that I, I was there. Obviously, you know, the museum that we're building in Glendale, uh, I was, you know, when the archbishops both call you and say, please help, uh, <laughs> c construction costs are going up because of COVID, can we find more resources? Uh, I was able to find an additional $10 million to, to help the museum. And so the state's investment is just under $20 million. We've, uh, the state is investing $19.8 million into the museum. That's a significant investment. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's, it's a good priority. And, Again, to give Governor Newsom credit, you know, he when he was mayor of San Francisco, he had a, a strong connection with the Armenian community there. He was the the cross was mm -hmm. a very controversial issue during his tenure yeah. there, and he supported uh, maintaining the cross. And so, he he's proud of his relationship, and uh, you know, I've been able to introduce him to not just the San Francisco piece of it, but the overall piece of it and he's been very responsive and, and you know we wouldn't have had the, the 20 million dollars without his his support. Yeah um, so your term is up in the Senate uh, what can be done to ensure that some of the efforts that you've kind of spearheaded or mm -hmm. been involved in continue? Uh, well I'm very excited that John Harabidian is going to be the new assembly member from the Pasadena side. You know, mm -hmm. my district has, yeah. has two sides to it. It has the Pasadena side and the Glendale side. And so on the Pasadena side in the assembly, we're, I, I believe come two weeks from now, John Hadabidian is going to be elected to the state assembly. So that's uh, very good news to have uh, a, an Armenian American in the legislature right now. I, I like to say I'm the honorary, <laughs> um, but there's, uh, and, and of my 23 and me, there's like 1% from the Caucasus. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm 83% I'm Italian and, and like 1.5% from the Caucasus. <laughs> so I'll, 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 I'll put that out there. But John, you know, is, is a talented uh, young uh, political leader. And so I've been, he's also a good friend. Um, and so uh, I think we have to make sure that he, you know, carries on this legacy. And I know he's going to. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's important for us who are leaving office. Uh, obviously, Sha Sasha Renee Perez is going to be the new senator. Um, and I, I have a good relationship with her. And so uh, I think it's important for them to, to, you know, continue to reach out to the community. Uh, in my office, you know, we've had a long 
uh, career of having Armenian American mm -hmm. staff members, which also promotes uh, the perspective. Um, you know, in in my case, I have both Western speakers and Eastern speakers, um, and so you know, we want to represent the community as a whole, and so I will encourage uh, my new colleagues um, to make sure that their staff reflects the district as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important because, you know, I learn from my staff. I don't, yeah. you know, as many times as I've been to Hayastan, it's not the same as having a staff member yeah. who was born in Hayastan. Um, and when I talk to folks from the diaspora, you get a different perspective when you talk to somebody whose family came from Beirut or from Turkey or from other parts of the diaspora. And so I think that's important. And so I think we should all, you know, as we talk to the new elected representatives to make sure that, it, that they know how important it is for the community to have Armenian staff uh, on their staffs. And also, uh, it's kind of also incumbent on the uh, constituents to ask for, Correct. you know, continuing those efforts, Absolutely. the trade office, uh, uh, and keeping the Artsakh name and uh, commission, right. uh, uh, because that's how you're going to promote this mm -hmm. issue of self-determination and right. uh, justice <laughs> at the end of the day. And also visit, visit Hayastan mm -hmm. too. I mean, that's the other thing is, uh, you know, the, the newly elected representatives need to go firsthand. I mean, in my case, in 2016, I went to Agdam. I was in the foxhole. I was 200 yards away from the, the tanks that attacked mm -hmm. during the four-day war. Um, you know, I got to hear from the soldiers uh, directly. And it's a story that I've shared, but, you know, it was so prophetic and so sad that one soldier looked at us in the eye in 2016 and said, we know we're on our own. He said, we know even our friends aren't our friends. You know, so they, so, and then he said, we're going to stand here, we're going to fight here, we're going to die here. You know, the soldiers were dedicated to protecting their country, but they knew that they were going to have to do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they were so right and so valiant and so brave. Um, and the people are paying the price because, you know, the Minsk group, Russia, others did not help uh, to the extent that they were supposed to help. And so um, here we are. I mean, w one thing about the Artsakhs is, uh, is uh, that, you know, for them, they knew that they were the only uh, people who were going to, uh, right. you know, protect uh, that land. and. Uh, I, mean, I think they'll rise up again. And <laughs> well, I will tell you, when I went back on my fourth trip uh, to Artsakh, uh, again, I, I went post 44 day war and I was in a village right up against the Azeri camps. And those villagers were so proud and so strong and so wonderful. And uh, to give you an idea of how isolated they were, they had no COVID. <laughs> I mean, there was no, yeah. there, you know, there was no, I mean, so it was an isolated group of, of villagers. Um, now they had a lot of vodka. Yeah. Um, and so they, we, they shared the vodka liberally at lunch, but they shared their passion and their love for their country and their determination. You know, we have to find a way to help these folks repatriate, repopulate, get, get their homelands back. And then, of course, safely and safely, with dignity, with dignity and, and re reclaim the, the mm -hmm. churches, you know, the historic sites. I mean, this is where the international community, where people need to step up and do more. Um, and of course, you know, it was part of my message to the ambassador when I was there to, to do more. Um, I will share a funny story. When I went uh, in 2021, I met with the ambassador after I came back from Artsakh because I didn't want them to say, don't go. Um, <laughs> so I purposely scheduled my appointment. And, and I will share that when I said to, there was a different ambassador, I said, oh, by the way, I was in Artsakh yesterday. And she went, how did you get in? <laughs> and I said, well, I know people. Yeah. Um, but uh, just the resiliency, the, the love. Uh, and I, it, it, it was contagious for me, too. Yeah. How has the state of California transformed since uh, you were in uh, the legislature? What do, what do you see for the future of our state? Well, you know, obviously we're, we, we've had a tough budget year this year. Um, and so I think that's going to be the dominant issue going forward. We were able to make sure that public education was, was 
funded uh, without significant cuts this year. Um, you know, obviously, during COVID, there was lots of federal dollars that, you know, was one of the reasons why I was mm -hmm. able to get more money for the museum. You know, so we went from this time where we had a $95 billion surplus to a $30 billion deficit like that. Yeah. And so I think the economic conversation is going to continue to be a dominant conversation going forward. Overall, though, um, you know, I think California is doing well. Um, you know, we lead the nation on so many important issues. Um, and, uh, you know, there's lots of conversation. I think that's, I, I think since COVID, there's been more conversations. Pre-COVID, a lot of decisions were just made in a vacuum. Uh, one of the observations I've seen um, is post-COVID, uh, caucus members, uh, you know, new members, old members, uh, are much more, they're, they're much more cognizant that time is a fleeting commodity and mm -hmm. that, you know, every moment counts much more. And so I, I think post-COVID, the, the robust conversation member to member on policy has been much more encouraging and I think you're going to see, you know, better decisions. You know, it took, obviously, it took a tragedy. It took a global yeah. pandemic to sort of shake everybody into this idea that we have to talk to each other. But there's been much more conversations um, about important issues than, than sort of top-down lecturing. There's much more bottom-up. And I, that's my message to, to activists. You know, the role of the activist is to make us do better. You know, yeah. we, you know, uh, many of the ideas that I've put into policy have come because activists have come, you know, uh, it's a small bill that I did on fetal alcohol syndrome, children that are afflicted mm -hmm. with fetal alcohol syndrome. I was not aware that those students did not get their own individualized education plan based on their affliction. They only got it into the, into the system if they had other issues but not for their actual oh, issue. Wow. And so the activists came to me, the moms came to me and said, hey, you know, we struggle with getting the resources for our kids because they're being classified as autistic. When they're not autistic, they're with fetal mm -hmm. alcohol syndrome. And so because of that conversation with the activists, I was able to change state law to, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. I set up California's umbilical cord collection program where we actually store those stem cells mm -hmm. to cure thalassemia and sickle cell anemia and leukemia, all the blood cancers, which affect a lot of Mediterranean people. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was a conversation with a mom who shared the story of their child getting a cord blood transplant. And so I, I share this because this is not a, 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 a business where you can be shy. Mm -hmm. If you have a perspective, share it. This is the time to be active and, and, and make positive change. And I will say my colleagues are much more open to conversation than they were pre, pre-COVID. It's refreshing to hear that actually there is conversation happening within the uh, legislature and the state capitol because certainly the national tenor uh, right now does not reflect Correct. conversation and, um, you know. It's sad. It is, it is very sad because I think uh, people should sit around the table and talk about their differences right. like you just pointed out with uh, the American University of Armenia, right. that the students are friends, but they don't, not everyone has the same opinion or uh, perspective. And I think it's very healthy and important to healthy. put it on the table as opposed to, you know, retreat to your own corners. And, and that's one of the biggest challenges. You see statistically too in the US, people will only date people who are of the same party. Yeah. You know, it didn't used to be that way. People didn't ask when they, they first met you, are you a Republican or a Democrat? That was like the 50th question, not the first question. <laughs> you know, now, you know, it's become so tribal. Um, and, you know, we're all in our own space, just hearing from our own echo chamber. And that's also one of the biggest changes in media. You know, 50 years ago, people tuned into Walter Cronkite to be informed. Mm -hmm. Now they tune into a show to be confirmed what they think. Yeah. They all want to hear validation. It's not, it, you know, I should say all, but there's a trend where more people want to feel validated for their opinions as opposed to being informed of what's yeah. happening in the world. Um, and then, I, since we're on conversation, another sort of cultural change is people used to go to a coffee shop to talk to each other. Now when you go into a Starbucks or your local coffee shop, everybody's got headphones yeah. in. They're all <laughs> listening to their own song. They're not talking to each other. It's a change in the, in the social, cultural interactions of people. 
Well, you, you've certainly been um, one of the uh, uh, officials who have had his imprint on so many things that has affected the district as well as has positively impacted our community. Um, and I think that's very important to always underline and bold and italicize because uh, some of the things that you have done during your tenure, uh, just the fact that you got up and went to Artsakh right after the war, speaks to your understanding of not just the issues and but the complexities that surround the issue as well as your constituents. And yeah, that, that is something that I think needs to be um, emphasized and you know, I thank you. Uh, go ahead. What I was going to say is what my, my sort of uh, suggestion to other political leaders is put yourself in a position to where you can be trusted and you can learn. You know, uh, I went to Artsakh post 44 day war because Artak, the human rights defender, yeah. invited me because I had sat with him numerous times to talk about the issue. And so for me, it was a tremendous honor that Artak would ask me to be that, mm -hmm. you know, political leader in the United States to go post 44 day war to send a message. And so of course I'm going to say yes. Yeah. I mean, how do you say no when the human rights defender asks you? Um, you know, I was able to change state law to let Glendale College close on April 24th and not lose any money um, because Armini Akopian, the board member, pulled me aside and said, hey, did you know we lose a half a million dollars every year when we close on April 24th, but Glendale Unified doesn't because the law for community colleges is different than the law for high schools. And so when GUSD closed, they don't lose money, but when GCC closes, we lose a half That's a million dollars. But it was Armine Akopian who came to me and asked me to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And so that's my lesson to, to other political leaders is become friends and students of the communities you represent and they'll bring you problems that you need to use your office to then mm -hmm. solve. And so that's what I love about what I get to do. Is, yeah. You know, people bring their ideas to me and I get to, you know, change the world based on the input that I get from the constituents. What is the next chapter? I don't know. I keep making a joke saying I'm going to be home and drive my wife crazy, <laughs> ride my bicycle. But I still have some fuel in my tank. Um, you know, I, I have more to give and I'll, I'll, I'll figure out another path. And, you know, obviously I'm going to continue to be active and, and, and stay around and, and be present and, and be me. And we'll see you at events. And you'll see me at events. Very good. Thank you so much oh, for good. taking the time. And, Thank you. Uh, coming uh, here. And the important message is that uh, you, everyone should be an activist and you should take ownership of the area in which you live because at the end of the day it's not just your house, it's your community. Absolutely. And of course, uh, don't forget to vote on November 5th. You can actually go and vote now, but if you want to uh, wait until Tuesday, November 5th, make sure that you uh, cast your ballot. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day.